Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. This is our 100th plus one episode. Hmm. You know what that means, right, Mike? Uh, there have been 100 so far. 100 episodes so far, and do you remember which number you were? I was one. So you were you number one. You told me I was one, anyway. I did tell you. Yeah. Well, Puddle says you're number one. Oh. Well, I believe Puddle. Yeah, okay. you're number one. <laughs> and uh, so this is our, our, we're getting back to our roots. Puddles wanted to uh, come back and, and visit with Mike because back in those early few episodes, the format was a little bit different. We were trying to keep things a little bit on the shorter side. Um, and I, as time went on, we, we realized that uh, really that we were leaving material, important material, undeveloped. Sure, yeah. And so... Uh, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it. And so we thought, what better way to start our second 100 episodes but coming back to you. Sounds good to me. So we're in Medford, Oregon. Welcome to Oregon, Mike. Thanks. You're good welcome. to be here. Michael's here playing uh, 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 with the Peter Britt Festival Orchestra in Jacksonville, Oregon. And are you playing bass trombone with them? Yes, correct. And you play principal trombone in the Tucson Symphony. Yeah. So you play, you just play trombone. That's, uh, that's what I do. I play trombone. And I, you know, I think that uh, if Jacobs, uh, Mr. Jacobs was here, he would say the same thing. Just play trombone. Just play music. I remember him talking about uh, trombonists uh, making too much of a b big deal about the separation between the the two instruments. There are differences, but definitely differences. Yeah, it's just a trombone. Yeah, and uh, you can pick up the bass trombone if you play tenor primarily, and it's not going to be like the best bass trombone sound immediately. But I think that was his point: is that you had the concept in your head, you had the song, you had the the way it was supposed to sound up here, and you would start and you would just keep going until you formed it. You know, he would say, you start with crudity, it's okay. You know, but the, the message up here had to be strong. Right. You can, you can refine crudity, but you can't refine silence. Exactly, right. So, yeah, that, that, that's, that's pretty good. I'm wondering, uh, just exploring some other, some other topics, um, when he had you working out of uh, technical books, that sort of thing, what do mm -hmm. you remember about uh, those, those occasions? Well, I remember once uh, I came in with the Arbin book, and everybody knows those simple, they're like 26 or so, those simple exercises at the beginning. And there's the one that goes, yum, bum, 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 And I was playing it, I was playing it well, you know, I was hitting the notes, and the sound was okay. But he stopped me, and he said, well, you know, that's pretty good. That's good trombone playing. But, uh, why don't you make music out of this? You know, just because it's in the Arvin book and it's supposed to be a technical exercise doesn't mean that it shouldn't be musical. Everything you play should be musical. And so I played it again. He, and he suggested that maybe it was a waltz, had a, had a waltz feel to it. So I played it again and I really, you know, hammed it up. I really well, I would like to give him what he wanted so I would exaggerate, which turned out to be really good because you don't know. You think you're playing something a certain way, and it and it doesn't always come out. So it's always good to uh, accentuate it, exaggerate it a little bit. So I did it, and I played it more like yum bum 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 like he would sing it. You yeah. Know? And I just remember thinking, uh, wow, this is so much more fun to play this this way, and it just is. It's more more musical. And he stopped me and slapped me on the knee and said, yes, now that's that's music. You know, the other one was just a, a, an athletic event, and, and this is music. I, I think that was a, a, such an important factor of his teaching is he didn't, he didn't uh, necessarily s separate music from the notes. He wanted you to have music with the notes. Exactly, and I remember, uh, as I said in the first interview, I, for some reason, was lucky enough to have my first a lesson with Mr. Jacobs when I was 13 and uh, one of the first things he told me was that these markings on the page, these notes, uh, they, they don't mean anything. I mean they're just uh, like words on a page. Mm -hmm. You have to turn them into music. They represent sounds. And of course that's obvious to everybody that it, they represent sounds, but when you're 13 and you're hearing this, it, it really uh, makes the point uh, that stuck with me forever that you really have to uh, make songs, you have to make music 
out of those black dots on the page. You know, they're just they just represent. They're just symbols. Yeah. Do you remember him working with you um, in terms of playing the mouthpiece or uh, what that meant or what he? Sure. Uh, well, you know, you've heard the stories how he would take his ring and he would put it all over his face and he would buzz the same pitches and I think it really, you know, he was, the point was really well taken that your body is going to respond to the right, the right message, right? If you've got the right pitch in your head, if you've got the right song here, it, it doesn't matter where you put it, you're going to get those pitches. You know, obviously if you're playing, you, there's muscular development, so if you're you're going to get a better sound, a more developed sound if you're playing it where you're, you've been doing it for years. But the point was that the message has to be right. Mm -hmm. And you can put the mouthpiece here, and you can put the mouthpiece here or here, and you can still make the pitch because the body responds to the correct input. Yeah. And I think that also really stuck with me uh, forever. You know. So do you, do you uh, um, buzz the mouthpiece yourself? No. Yeah, I mean, is that yeah. something that you stuck with? Oh yeah, I buzz it uh, every practice session. I'm buzzing the mouthpiece. And so, aside from uh, uh, you're trying to get the uh, the mental connection, the the pitches, the sound in mm -hmm. your mind to hear, is there any other? Of course, there's benefit a or? yeah. There's a there's a technical benefit. You can obviously tell if you're buzzing the mouthpiece. You can tell if you're holding tension by the way the buzz sounds, if it's very rigid or if it's shaking, you're, you're probably holding tension or there's some sort of impediment, maybe the tongue. So it does absolutely have a technical benefit and you can show, it shows you how your air is flowing through the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all really good tools. Uh, the, the mouthpiece is a, buzzing the mouthpiece is a good tool to show you a lot of things, both physically and also you know what you're doing up here too. I remember in my in my lessons, uh, and it sort of speaks to the, the your first point. Um, it should be a, even even playing the mouthpiece is, is it's all about music. Yeah. It wasn't about drill forms or technical no. studies, and I think that's something that uh, ha that he he progressed more and more toward um, over the course of his teaching right. career. These are our vocal cords. So if you put a ring to it and you start buzzing, music should come out. There should be a, a musical message or a story that you're telling with your vocal cords. So if it's a ring, if it's a mouthpiece, if it's in the horn, this doesn't change. Right. This sends the message. So you want to be, you want to develop. Yes, and I tell my students, and I of course do it myself. You know, but listening to great musicians is as important as practicing, maybe more important. You know, you need inspiration, you need to emulate. Mm -hmm. And of course, we all know Jake was uh, very, very much an advocate of singing, because the singing approach is synonymous with Jake. Uh, so I took that very literally, and I took singing lessons. Uh, and I listened to many singers, and I think my the person I emulate the most uh, is probably Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. Right. I think that if I could somehow come close to sounding like him on the trombone or whatever that means, that that would be the ultimate goal. Trying to get all the nuance, the color, the expression, especially the way he uh, had such so much attention to the words, the text when he sang. Yeah. yeah put a, so much meaning into the music. Yeah, so if you can do that on the trombone, and even if you can try to do it on the mouthpiece, it's right. even going to be better on the trombone. Right, you should definitely try. It doesn't matter. It's not going to sound like anybody else, but the fact that you're trying, that you have a really strong roadmap in your head about tone, color, nuance, emotion, all that stuff, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the way you play. It's going to change the way you sound. You're going to be more expressive. Michael, uh, so you started studying with Mr. Jacobs at age 13, very unusual, um, and then you continued that through how long, would you say? Well, I took two lessons with him when I was 13. And, yeah. Yeah, and then I came back uh, when I was in college, so I was 18. Okay. Yeah. So you come out, you were at IU at the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you come up from Bloomington or just go to him on breaks? Yeah, sure. Okay. 
And then how long did that those 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 collegiate and post collegiate lessons go? Just on and off until well, right up until shortly before he passed away. Michael and I started our careers together in the Savannah Symphony way back in well, this is like our thirtieth anniversary year. Yeah, yeah, a little gray. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh huh. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we had lots to talk about, lots to lots to share about our experience with, experiences with Mr. Jacobs. What do you suppose was the? I would also say that I would call him too. Yeah. I used to call him from uh, wherever I was, and I remember calling him from Savannah. Yeah. I had a, I mean, I was 23. It was my first job. A lot of challenges, and so I would often call him, and say, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this. It's you know, it's giving me, you know." <laughs> it's Looking causing forward. a lot of stress. Yeah, and sure. Just hearing him talk uh, and it just talk me through these things was was a great lesson in itself. This is true. Uh, I think many many people, myself included, did the same thing. Just yeah. to call him up to get a just a refresher, uh, get a little bit of advice. Yeah, yeah. It, it was amazing because you. It was almost as if he could just say anything. You would just hear his booming voice. Yeah, and you just knew. If you could just feel what he was going to say, and it just, all, it was comforting just to, just to talk to him. And yeah, it gave you a lot of confidence. Yeah, it was really. And, and it put your mind on again the right thing, which was say something musical when you play. You got something uh, up that week, whether it's let's say it's bolero, let's say it's Zarathustra, whatever it is. Put your mind on the music. Don't put your mind on that this is a difficult thing to play. I mean, that's that you could you could almost say that was his greatest lesson to us. Yes, that's probably one, certainly one of the greatest lessons I took away. Is that everything has to be musical. Approach everything musically. Tell the story. Tell the story, right? I think it was probably if I had to pick one thing that was great that he would never tell me how to play something. He would never say, "Oh." You know, this note has to be longer, and you should maybe accent this and put some expression on. He, that's that really wasn't his thing. He would he would demand that you find a way to be musical. Mm -hmm. You had to reach inside yourself and draw on whatever experiences you had and whatever the music meant to you, and put your own personality into the music. That that probably is the greatest lesson, because that's something you have to do throughout your entire career can't depend on somebody else to spoon feed you about style and about what this what you're trying to say with this music of course you know in the orchestral setting there are limitations but you still have to think that way uh, to perform uh, at your highest level mm -hmm. yeah you have any, any, any good uh, anecdotes any lesson anecdotes or uh, funny stories or anything actually I do <laughs> really <laughs> a kind of funny story it was I was Speaking of Zarathustra, I was playing, playing it for him. You know, the palm, 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 palm. You know, up in uh, higher octave, of course. Yeah. And I uh, kept smashing that D. You know, no matter how hard I tried, wait a minute, I can do it. I can do it. Do it again. Smash the D. And so he he let me do it a couple times, and and he and he just said, you you're totally not. I mean, in his own words, yeah. you're totally not thinking about music at all. I can tell when you're playing the lower octave that you're thinking about the high D because it wasn't my best sound. Obviously, I was so worried about the high D that the rest of it was suffering. It, it wasn't with my best sound. So he suggested I put words to it. And so he came up with some words and he said, there he goes out the door. And he said, well, that's a hell of a thing to say at an audition. <laughs> <laughs> That would be. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Well. But I think the point is that he wanted you to get into the, he wanted you to get inside yourself musically and singing a song, songs have words, and it just totally takes you out of your technical mind, puts you in a musical mind. Right. And so it's, it's, uh, um, makes it not an athletic event, but a musical event in your thinking. Right. So you yeah. just you really focus on the right. You're in a flow. When you sing a song, if you really know a song, you know the words. 
you maybe don't even have to think about the words. It's just, it becomes automatic. And uh, for whatever reason, putting words uh, to it takes you into musical mode. Uh, and it takes you away from paralysis by analysis. Right. Yeah, well, you start being a, a motor nerve musician and not a not a receptor nerve musician. Right. Basically. Yeah, I mean, he would always, sometimes he would make an example of it. With a, he would take the pencil on the stand or something and he would throw it up of course and you'd grab it with your hand. You didn't have, you don't have to think about what you do with your shoulder or your elbow and you know, those things happen automatically. You know, yeah. you got a message, boom, catch the pencil. Yeah. It happens. So and that's ultimately what it should be. You see the music, hear it in your head. Or you have no music, it's just coming out, it's flowing out through your vocal cords, through the instrument. Be a bra- be a brass singer. Be a brass singer, right, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, Michael, um, it's been really good to see you again. You too. And uh, I can't... I just saw you two weeks ago, you know. At the Mike the, Becker Low Brass Boot Camp. Right, yes. That's right. In Chicago. In Chicago. That was a great, that was a great week. It was. A great week. I always... Uh, it's, it's tiring, but it's, it's extremely rewarding. Mm-hmm. Uh, teaching, for me, is a good teacher for myself. Right. Teaching... When I teach, I become a better player, too. You always learn something when you teach. You do, yeah, you absolutely do. And it's good to uh, explain things. We have to explain things not only, uh, you have to articulate them with words. That's a good thing to do. It, it really helps you understand what it is you're trying to say, even though you're trying to get somebody else to do it. You, and that's the other challenge. You have to figure out a way to say something to a student, to another human being, mm-hmm. in a way that they understand uh, what you want. And you, that's why teaching is a... It's exhausting. A, it's exhausting, it's but exhausting. it's great for your own playing, too. Yeah. And for your brain, because you have to... If you just teach one way, I play it this way, I'm going to say the same thing to everybody no matter what. Uh, I don't think you would be as successful of a teacher if you really try to figure out a way to connect with that person as an individual. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's, that's what I really like about teaching and about the boot camp, too. And I think, getting back to Jacobs, that, that, that was one of the things that made him such a, a fantastic teacher, is he, he not only knew about how we were put together from a physiological standpoint, but he, he had a great amount of knowledge psychologically about how we operated as people, psychologically, and so he, he could really find out where you were right, uh, yeah. as a person and, and to figure out how to communicate best with you, what what communication would work best with you. Definitely, definitely. And I think that ties into why he would never tell you how so much to play something mm-hmm. musically. He would he would demand that you find a way to play something musically. And if it wasn't, he would stop you again. Say, no, I didn't I didn't think that was musical. So mm-hmm. you you had to, you know, research your own memory banks and figure out a way, you know. That's why the listening aspect is so important. Yeah. You have to have these things to draw on. You do. You do. You have to have the core message. Right. I, you know, he used to always say, when, when something was slow, for example, it was a legato etude or something, he said, why don't you play it like a love song? I think that was the easiest way to connect immediately with somebody. Yeah. Play, with a, play it like it was a love song. Because, you know, love is such a universal expression, and, and we all feel it, so it's something that we can draw on immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, all those things that you take away from learning songs and learning the words and playing them on your instrument, you can take that back to all the music that you play that doesn't have words, whatever it is. To the orchestra, it's your solos, it's your uh, uh, Bordoni etudes, whatever it is, you can bring all that stuff back, all that material, all the things that you've learned about those kinds of techniques, you can bring back to the music. Uh, that doesn't have words, and you have to come up with the entire meaning yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a really valuable uh, tool. I think it's a really valuable. It's not just a tool. It's a it's a great way to play music. Yeah. Right. Uh, oftentimes, I'll find myself telling my students to uh, um, play play the music, not not the notes, mm-hmm. or something to that effect. Right. And uh, that seems like. Uh, he he was so so keen on on getting us to do that um, to really see those ink spots and yeah 
Absolutely. Turn them into a message. Right. You had to think for yourself. He made you. He pushed you. Yeah. Think for yourself, but he he gave you so much inspiration and and it's just such a wealth of knowledge about let's just put the music aside. What was going on physiologically, psychologically too, to help you gain insight into that. And when it's all tied together, it was made simple by just singing through the horn. And you know, playing you want to get better on your instrument. Put something challenging. Take take a solo that's challenging for yourself and 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 learn it and and push yourself. But it's for me it's easier to gain technique on the trombone if I'm if I'm playing something like that that has more meaning to me, you know. For example, Bach cello suites. Uh, they might seem simple, but obviously we all know they're not easy. Mm -hmm. But it's such great music mm -hmm. that you just want to figure out all the different ways you can play this and make it musical. And yet, here at the same time, you're just getting better on your instrument. You're getting better, for me, you're getting to be a much better trombone player by playing Bach cello suites. That's one example. Yep. And then, of course, you know, zillions of solos that are challenging also, too. Yeah. But that, to me, is the best approach. I try to, uh, for myself and for my students, try to get them to, if they're having trouble with something technically, if there's a technical hurdle, try to get them to think musically first, see if they can just overcome it, uh, figure it out intuitively. Mm -hmm. And then, if there's really a problem, then you can start to maybe dive into the, you know, the whole, what's going on with the air, are you holding tension, you know, just making them aware of that sort of thing, too. Right. Well, for those viewers who, who tuned in to episode number one, uh, and then which was followed by a uh, particular uh, bloopers reel, you may recall that I had a very difficult time presenting Michael Becker with uh, uh, his complimentary portion of duck nuts. So uh, I've dispensed with the duck nuts for today. Much to Puddle's great cheer. Um, but what we have is and I also might add that after I received the duck nuts, uh -huh. I went home and opened them, and I was crestfallen because they were rancid. They had expired. Yes. So. Well, this won't expire. <laughs> so uh, Puddles and I would like to uh, uh, try to make up for the rancid duck nuts. I think they, they were good when we started the video, but it took us so long to, <laughs> right. to get through it that they went rancid. They did, yeah. It took, you know, it took a long a time. A year and a half to make the video. Yeah. So. <laughs> We'd like to thank you and present you with this genuine Tube of People TV water bottle. Or Thanks. Or whatever you want to put in it. What do you mean by that? Water. Oh. Yeah. Smart water. Huh? Gatorade. Or kombucha. Look, it's made in America. <laughs> it's made right here in Medford, actually. All right. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. It's great. Great to see you. Great to see you. As always. Thank you. And now back to you.